As we've been in James uh, this more, uh, this these last few weeks, um, in our study so far, we've seen this is a really practical book, hence the practical wisdom for the Christian life that we have up here. James is concerned about how believers think, but he is especially concerned about how this right belief translates into change and right behavior. He's not just wanting to make sure that we get it figured out up here, but that what is here and here comes out here from our hearts and our head, our, our hearts and our head and into our hands and into our daily life. Probably the most famous verse we looked at a few weeks ago, be doers of the word and not hearers only. And James writes for, he writes this because just to be a hearer only is, is to find yourself in self-deception, is to be deceived, leading one to think that you're okay with God when in fact you're not. Such hearing, hearing that is hearing only that does not result in, in doing, James says it is good for nothing for nothing. This is at the heart of what James writes in the verses that we will read this morning, 14 to 19, that when one claims to have faith, but there is no resulting works, such a faith is a good for nothing faith. It is a dead faith. It is not a saving faith. Brothers and sisters, genuine faith in our hearts results in saving faith. It results in fruit in our lives. Genuine faith in our hearts results in fruit in our lives. So let's read together. If you are able, I invite you to stand uh, with me as we read the Word of God together. Verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is, is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown? Nope, that's where I was going to stop. <laughs> We're ending at verse 19 today. Such good stuff. I wanted to keep going. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, it is a challenging word this morning. Lord, as we come to your word today and every day, I pray that our, our hearts, our minds, our attitudes, our commitment would always be to say, yes, Lord. As you show yourself to us in your word, as you reveal your heart and your desire for us, Lord, help us to be ready to say yes, to respond to you in faith and obedience. Lord, help us to put away pride, self-deception, and to embrace your truth and be conformed by your truth. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, how many of you have heard it said as I have, do as I say, not as I do? You ever hear that refrain, especially growing up, maybe from your parents, do as I say and not as I do? I know I heard it. A few times growing up, and I'll admit, I didn't like it very much. Uh, I hear that phrase, I'm like, "What is this a double standard, Dad? That uh, I could, you don't want, want me to act a certain way, but it's okay for for you to do it. Why why should I do what you say if you're not willing to do what you say?" But as a parent now, I get it a little bit more. Um, I don't want my kids to imitate my sin. When I fly off the handle or spout off some smart remark or my pride comes glaring through, I don't want my kids to, to see that and think, well, dad did it, so I guess it's okay. You know, I've taught against these things, but sometimes I still do them. And so saying something like, do as I say, not as I do, it makes more sense now to me than 
than ever. And all this fits with what Paul writes in Romans 7. For I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I, for I do not the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. There will be, at times, inconsistencies between the things that we teach and the way that we live. And those inconsistencies are going to be especially seen by those who are closest to us. Our spouse, our children. If you're a child here, your parents are going to see those things. We are sinners. And we are in the process of sanctification. Being made more and more holy with each and every passing day, Lord willing. We have been declared holy positionally. But practically, we are not there yet. But as you think about this phrase, do as I say and not as I do, we know that if, if one is all say and never do, then there really is a serious problem. If one is all say and never do, there's a problem. It's like when parents say they prior, prioritize church over any other activity, but where do you find them on a Sunday but at the ball field or, or at some other sporting event? They're MIA on Sunday morning, not exactly showing what they say they're believing. Or it's like when a, we see a husband who insists that he cherishes his wife, but yet maintains a secret longstanding affair with another woman. We know this is a serious problem. The actions do not match the words. Behavior does not match what is claimed to be believed. And far more than what we say, brothers and sisters, our behavior reveals what we really think, what we really believe, and what we really value. Our behavior reveals this. As one pastor put it, our claims, what we say, are not always an accurate ref reflection of what we really think or believe, but our deeds are. We, are not, we do not always live what we say we believe, but we, always, but we do always believe what we live out what we believe, what we, what we do reflects what we believe. You see, belief drives behavior. And whether we want to admit it <clears throat> or not, the way that we live reveals what we believe. As we work our way through the text today, we're going to see three main truths and three key conclusions. I want to start today with the three main truths. And the first one is this. Faith in our hearts is evident by the fruit in our lives. Faith in our hearts is evident by the fruit in our lives. James begins verse 14 with a question. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Can such a faith save him? James presents two kinds of faith, a, a saving faith, and a faith that is not saving, which genuinely is no true faith at all, is it? Now, to clue his, his readers in on the difference between these two types of faith, a, a saving faith and a not-so-saving faith, and to understand what true saving faith is, what he does is he gives us a scenario. In fact, he gives us a few scenarios over the course of these next few verses. The scenario is of someone who says he has faith, but he doesn't have works. This is someone who says he believes in God, that says that he has placed his trust in Jesus, that he believes the Bible, says that he is a follower of Jesus, but yet there is no evidence, no fruit, no works in this individual's life. And the question asked here in presenting this scenario, it's a rhetorical question. James does not expect that someone is going to answer by, by saying, well, there are some elements of good that comes from a faith that doesn't have any works that come from it. Of course not. What he's saying is, of course not. There is no good that comes from a faith that doesn't play out in works. No good. He says, can such a faith that is devoid of works save someone? Of course not. Saving faith is marked, brothers and sisters, by fruit. Faith in our hearts is evident by the fruit in our lives. If there is no fruit in our lives, odds are there is no saving faith within. 
one cannot have an encounter with the living God and remain uh, and remain unchanged. It's like it's like a house that's not lived in. I remember going every Sunday whenever we would go to church as I was a kid growing up, we'd go past this house, and I thought it was the coolest house. It had this awesome front porch that kind of wrapped around and a and a chimney in it with a fireplace. I'm sure because it had a nice chimney. Uh, that's at least what I always imagined. And I don't have a real great front porch or a fireplace, but right now it's kind of what I would like. But but so this house had those things, but it, nobody lived in it. It was a house that no one lived in. It was on the corner of a field. Now, as I drive past there today, it's been bulldozed down and uh, and they put beans where that house once was. But there was no life, no going in, no going out, no no keeping up the lawn, no raking of the leaves, and the house would just begin to fall down, and it did. But there's something different about a house that's lived in. A house that is lived in has life. There is activity. There is This home is, is cared for. The, the grass is mowed. The leaves are raked. And likewise, brother, sister, you're, you are now, as a believer, a lived-in home. Where before you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and it was vacant of the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit has moved in. But where before there was no life whatsoever and no activity, when you were saved, God raised you to new life in Christ, and the Holy Spirit moved in and took up residence. Glory to God. You became alive. And with that life is evidence. In Awana, we sing the fruit of the Spirit song. We say the fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut. And they knock on their heads. And, but it is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And these are the things that ought to be seen in a life in which the Holy Spirit resides. It's a house that's got activity. There's things going on there. But if there is no fruit in our lives... There are no works that correspond to this professed faith. Then James warns that such a faith is no saving faith. The second main truth gives us an example of, of such change that should be seen in the life of the believer, of the works that will be demonstrated by one who has saving faith. And so this is the second main truth here. People who fail to help poverty-stricken fellow believers are in fact not saved. As an example of a faith that does not save, James moves to another scenario. He says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace and be filled and be warm, without giving them the things that they need for the body, what good is that? Here's a fellow believer, a needy fellow believer, who does not have the means to stay warm. They don't have the clothes to stay warm as the temperatures fall in the fall and winter time. They don't even have food to get through that day. Their electricity is going to be shut off. The situation is dire and they are destitute. And in this scenario, what is the response of the fellow church member? To offer some religious language and tell them to have the things that they're not providing for them. Go in peace. Be warm. Be full. Eat. You have no food. You don't have clothes to stay warm. You're not doing anything about it. James says, what good is this kind of faith? What good is a faith that sees a needy brother or sister in Christ and does nothing? Nothing. Such a faith, a faith that is a hearer-only faith and not a hearer and then a doer faith is not a saving faith. It's not real faith. 1 John 3.17 echoes this truth. He says, if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need but closes his eyes to his need, how can God's love reside in him? The implication is it doesn't. Faith in our hearts is evident by fruit in our lives. And the coldness of our hearts reveals the deadness of our souls. Genuine faith will be accompanied by acts of mercy. But we must be clear here as we think about this. Acts of mercy, or any other works for that matter, are no means of salvation. In our age of, of secularism, there remains an impulse to serve the needy. 
the lost will even go and and like serve at a soup kitchen or give their time at a clothing bank or donate a few dollars on Giving Tuesday, which is coming up in a week and a half here or so. But no one is saved by serving in a soup kitchen or any other work of going to church or reading a Bible or giving to the church. Good works do not save. We sang of that this morning. Scripture makes this abundantly clear. One is justified by faith apart from works of the law. What the law does is it serves to show us our inability to keep it. It is a mirror that shows us that here's what is expected and here's what you can't do. You cannot do these things. You cannot love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You can't get past the first commandment, let alone getting down to adultery and greed and covetousness. Good works do not save. And that's why Jesus came, brothers and sisters. Good works do not save. And so Jesus came to save us from our sins. Jesus came to obey the law in our place, to obey what in a way that we could never do on our own. He obeyed for us, and then He died for us, and then He rose again so that all who turn from their sin and believe in Him might have everlasting life. This is our Savior. None of us is able to meet the demands of the law by our good works. Some that you talk to may refer to it like there's some kind of cosmic scale where you're trying to heap up more and more and more good works on this side to outweigh the bad that are on this side. And that if I can just get the scale to to tip in my favor, and if I can die before the scale tips back, that that's the way to go. More good works, more good works, more good works. Brothers and sisters, there is no cosmic scale. There is no cosmic scale. Our sin, tip the scales, if there were such a scale, irreconcilably so. It doesn't come back. We've already got the guilty verdict stamped. The only hope for those with the guilty verdict is another stamp over the top that erases it that says redeemed. That Jesus has died in our place for us that we might be saved. Good works do not save. All have sinned and therefore fall short of the glory of God. None is righteous, no, not one. As we read in Romans 3, we are dependent upon the perfect obedience of Christ credited to us credited to us through the work of the cross. As the, as the battle cry of the Reformation was, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. But, or and, I guess I should say maybe, the Protestant reformer Martin Luther clarified when he said, we are saved by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone. Did you hear that? Faith, we are saved by faith alone, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are saved by faith alone, but faith that saves is never alone. It's never found without works. It's never found without fruit. Saving faith results in fruit. And this is exactly what James is getting at. Don't claim to possess saving faith if your life reveals no fruit. Saving faith cannot, will not be alone. It will have works with it. And some of those works, as we read just a little moment ago, will be acts of mercy. Acts of mercy are not means to salvation, But those who have received salvation, have received mercy from Christ, will be merciful. They will care for the needy. They will perform acts of mercy. Jesus said in Matthew 25 that ministering to a poor brother or sister in Christ is like ministering to Christ himself. That's Matthew 25. To those who showed mercy and compassion to those in need, Jesus said, I assure you, whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers, you did for me. Then he turned to the other side. But for those who refuse mercy and compassion and, uh, to those in need, we read, Jesus said, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. 
I was naked and you didn't clothe me, sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me, then they too will answer. Lord, when did, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? And then he will answer them. I assure you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me either. And then the scripture says, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. See, brothers and sisters, in a very real way, Christ is in that brother or sister to whom you are ministering to in their need. And so when you don't do to them, you are not doing to Christ. That's what Jesus is teaching us there. Jesus says, whatever you did to them, you've done to me. And so whatever you didn't do for them, you didn't do for me either. And to those condemned, condemned to eternal punishment, they are not condemned, brothers and sisters. Let's not be confused here for their lack of mercy to the needy, though, yes, they were merciless to the needy. Understand this. Their lack of mercy to needy sinners reveals that they lack saving faith in Jesus Christ. And that is why they are condemned. It is because they lack saving faith that they refuse mercy to the needy. It is because of their lack of saving faith that they will be cast into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Though the righteous, Jesus says, go away into eternal life. And it's of these righteous that Spurgeon says, the saints fed the hungry and clothed the naked because it gave them much pleasure to do so. They did it because they could not help doing it. Their new nature impelled them to do it. They did it because it was their delight to do good. They did good for Christ's sake because it was the sweetest thing in the world to do anything for Jesus. Brother or sister, when you meet the needs of a needy brother or sister, you are doing this as an act of worship to God. You're doing it as if for Christ. Genuine saving faith makes for a people who help poverty-stricken believers. But people who claim to be Christians yet fail to help destitute believers reveal that they are, in fact, not saved. Third, then, third main truth is this. Ultimately, deedless faith is useless faith. You see, a third scenario comes up here in verse 18. It is someone who says, you have faith and I have works. This is, this is someone who argues that one can have faith and yet be without works, that they can have a saving faith and that someone else can have works, but you don't have to have the both. You know, we were talking in Sunday school a little bit about how sometimes the church is, is prone to extremes. Well, it seems that there are, are churches who are all about believing the right thing, which is good, but fail to put their faith to work. And then there are other churches, or Christians, that are all about doing and serving, which is also good. But if you were to ask one of their members to tell you the gospel, they probably couldn't even do it. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to faith and works, to believing the right things and being about kingdom work, it is never an either or scenario. It is always both and. We ought to passionately pursue truth and we ought to be moved to faithfulness in light of this truth. To the one who says, you have faith and I have works, James says, show me your faith. Show me. Show me by your fruit. Show me by your works. Make your faith visible. The only evidence visible to human eyes is the deeds of obedience. Faith is not seen unless faith is done. To show faith is to do works. And that's an act of one's faith. So to reiterate what James has been getting at since verse 14, faith in our hearts is evident by the fruit in our lives. Well, I said there are three main truths and three key conclusions. And you're probably thinking, oh man, is he going to go as long on these next three as he did in the first three? Um, don't worry, I won't. Uh, but let's get to these next three, the three key conclusions. And the first one is this. Faith is not mere intellectual assent. Faith is not merely putting something in your head. Verse 19, James argues, you think you're okay because you believe in one of the central tenets of the Christian faith. You believe that God is one. 
So what, he says, even the demons believe that. <laughs> In other words, knowing true things about God is not equivalent to having saving faith. Just because you know something true about God doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you saved. Head knowledge doesn't guarantee heart change. Believing something about God is not the same as believing in God. You see, to believe in God means that there is trust which results in action. Now, we may have, you may run into lots of people on the street who would say they believe in God. But my question to them would be, how does that belief in God change the way you live? And so hear this, church. Sound theology is not saving faith, okay? Sound theology is not saving faith. The demons have sound theology. They believe all the right things about God, but they remain in rebellion and enjoined to the forces of darkness. Brothers and sisters, saving faith is not found in agreeing to a list of statements, checking a list of boxes. Lots of people who say that they believe in God will go to hell. They're like the demons that said they believe some true things about God. They've never turned from their sin and embraced Christ as Savior and submitted to Him as Lord. They treat becoming a Christian maybe like taking out an insurance policy on your home. I don't know about you, but whenever I insured my house, it didn't change my behavior one bit about what I did for my house. Christians sometimes treat becoming, people sometimes treat becoming a Christian like just getting fire insurance. You get the insurance, but nothing changes. There's no change in your life. And for those who have got the fire insurance and then go on like nothing ever happened, unfortunately, Someday they're going to find that what they thought was an insurance policy was a fraudulent faith. How terrifying. Faith is not mere intellectual assent, but also it's not simply an emotional response either. You see, faith isn't simply an emotional response. James, James says the demons, they've got an emotional response. <laughs> they shudder. They are terrified. What the demons know about God leads them, to, leads them to shake in their boots. They fear, but yet remain in opposition to God. Maybe you at some point had an emotional response at some point in your life that you've built your faith upon. But brother and sister, it's not emotional responses that we build our faith upon. It is Jesus Christ and our hope in Him that we build our faith and our lives upon. Emotional responses are not invalid. It is right and good that the truth of God would stir up our emotions. That is a beautiful and blessed thing. But emotions, brothers and sisters, are not trustworthy. Just because you shudder doesn't mean you're saved. Saving faith results in God-honoring actions. So does your life bear that kind of fruit? Third, so faith isn't near, in, mere intellectual assent. It is not simply an emotional response. A saving faith does involve willful obedience. Faith involves willful obedience. James says, I will show you my faith by my works. He's not suggesting that works save someone. He's saying what Luther said, that while we are saved by faith alone, faith that saves is never alone. Saving faith will always be accompanied by works. You, are, if you, are, you who are saved, I encourage you, pursue holiness. Pursue faithful obedience to God's word, to live in God's way. Faith in our hearts is evident by the fruit in our lives. As James commanded in the last chapter, brothers and sisters, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If your faith, cons faith consists merely of listening to the Word, talking about the Word, feeling a certain way about God's Word, then God's Word says that your faith is dead. Saving faith acts on the Word. Saving faith makes for doers of the Word. So these verses, these verses present a grave danger that we need to hear this morning. The danger that it is possible to profess faith in Christ, but not be saved. It's possible to say you believe in Jesus, 
but not actually be a believer, not be a Christian. Just because you say you have faith doesn't mean you have saving faith. That's what James tells us in verse 14. So I ask you, does your life demonstrate saving faith? Saving faith is demonstrated by works. Is that what you see in your life? Does it demonstrate belief? Does it result trust in action? You know, we don't always, be, we don't always live out what we say we believe, but we do always believe what we live out. Whether we're willing to admit it or not, the way we live reveals what we believe. So if you're here today and you are being convicted that your life is not showing the fruit of your faith, brother or sister, let's talk. Let's talk today. You may say, yeah, I've been going to church. Yeah, I've been doing churchy things. But is your heart full of bitterness? Do you look condescendingly on poor brothers and sisters in the church? Are you harboring unforgiveness? Are you stingy only to give to the church and others begrudgingly or so that others will see you? Do you only think the worst of others and not the best? If you would say that you have a faith, but there's no fruit in your life, don't leave her today without dealing with the Lord and without talking with me or a trusted friend. Faith in our hearts is evident by the fruit in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to examine the fruit in our own lives. Help us not to push conviction aside right now. Lord, your, your, your word is, <laughs> it confronts us. It confronts our sin. Lord, give us grace to respond to the conviction that we feel with repentance. Lord, help us. Well, Lord, thank you for the reminder that genuine saving faith results and fruit in our lives. Lord, if there be any here who don't see any fruit, Lord, if there are here, some here who are not bearing fruit, I pray that you would help them to see that they are not bearing fruit. If any here are not bearing fruit, Lord, I pray that today they would commit to you to a true and genuine saving faith. A faith that would lead them to care for the needy, to be other-oriented, not self-oriented. Lord, we love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.